Matt George, host of the Locked On Kings podcast, uh, who's hard at work over uh, at ABC 10. Matt, well, we appreciate you. Well, hold on, hold on, because I, I didn't, I think this happened before the last time we talked to him, and I didn't know until I mistakenly went on Facebook. It was by accident, but I'm glad I did because I saw it. You're not just at ABC 10. Oh, we talking about, give me, what's the official title? The, the sports director? What's the official title, man? Let the people know. Uh, the new sports producer and reporter at ABC 10. Essentially, mm -hmm. the the new, and I, I can say this with love because they're massive shoes to fill and a massive hat to fill. Uh, I'm the new Sean Cunningham here at ABC 10. So, oh, uh, man. Big ups. Big ups. Big ups on that, man, George. I That's appreciate that, stuff, but it, it makes it easier. I don't know if y'all, sorry, audio listeners, but I don't know if y'all can see, but I got my boy, Kevin John behind me. He's our sports uh, anchor and, and lead reporter back there. And Kevin's made this transition like easy and he's a tremendous guy to work with. So yeah, that's <laughs> awesome, man. We're, 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 we're happy for you. You, um, it, you were, you were a pain in my ass when we first <laughs> met and to, uh, to see your growth in this industry and how hard you work and what you've done with that locked on Kings podcast, man, it's pretty awesome. Is it still is it still three a.m. for you? You gotta be up at three a.m. No, man, I'm I'm a, I'm on the night side back again. I'm go. with the nightlife people. I'm like go. I'm like D'Lo now. D'Lo always staying up late, never going to bed early. Right ah, here. you on that? You, you on that Kenny Caraway lifestyle? Yes, sir. <laughs> See, Matt and I used to be able to text at like four or five a.m. That was no problem. Like that ain't that, that ain't the case no more. <laughs> that That'll be right before no I go to bed. Matt, oh, Matt text <laughs> Matt texted me at uh ten forty five, like brother, you getting a response in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you are getting a response in the morning. Yeah. Um what's your biggest takeaway? You were you were at the press conference, you were at the yeah. Golden One Center. What was what's your big takeaway from uh Mike Brown and Monty McNair? Well, first off, the the show of support um there was was pretty incredible i think the word that i think is most appropriate to use was unity like there just seemed to be a showing of unity for the entire king's organization like there were players there of course De'Aaron fox was there uh terrence davis was there davion mitchell rashawn holmes those are the four that i noticed um but not just that almost the entire front office was there to support this hiring um a bunch of assistant coaches doug christie was there as well um so it was just really cool to see at least symbolic, a, a united front here to support this hire and support this new era and hopefully finally winning era uh, of Sacramento Kings basketball. So that jumped off the page to me. And then like uh, Dilo, I was explaining this to you, like you can see why Mike Brown is as well liked and respected around the league as he is. Like there's, there was two sides to Mike Brown that he seamlessly uh, or seamlessly transitioned in between. And it was the business side of Brown when he laid out for us, look, we need to change the culture here and this is how you do it. And I thought that was the best part of the press conference was him basically laying out his three-point plan of how the entire organization needs to change the culture, not just the basketball team. And then there's the happy, there's the the fun side of, of, of Brown talking about uh, his family that was in attendance, talking about the amount of rings that he has and talking about coming from the Golden State Warriors. Like I just was, if you can win a press conference, Mike Brown is is 1-0 to start the season already. Yeah. And and just for clarification, um, the, the guys that were there at the press conference, uh, it seemed like they were there working out previously and just went over to the press conference. So... You know, to see Rashawn, uh, De'Aaron, Davion, all seem to be getting work in at the facility uh, today and then decided to start by the, uh, the the press conference, huh? So it looked like it. I mean, Davion was the first one there. He was there super early, and he was actually sitting over there with us. And then um, Rashawn and Terrence Davis walked in right before the presser started, and then Fox walked in like a minute into the presser. Uh, but, yeah, they, they were all in, in workout gear, and Rashawn walked in with a towel around his neck, so he looked like he had just gotten off the floor. Yeah, that, that team is already looking like they're putting in work, not just chilling in Napa, but that was cool to see too. It, it, was, uh, it was interesting to uh, hear that, Mike had had uh, some conversations with guys as well. Uh, he went and watched De'Aaron Fox work out in, in San Diego. This was all during the playoffs and had already had a, a, a conversation with Rashawn Holmes. Um, De'Aaron obviously is a given. He, he's, he, I think he even referred to him as, as the head of the snake, which we've got to find a better analogy, but like th that's fine. But I think the conversation with Rashawn Holmes stood out and that launched me and Kenny into to, to a conversation about – it's probably, and I'm curious your thoughts because we're of the police. It's not necessarily the worst thing in the world if Rashawn Holmes remains a Sacramento King. 
Oh, not at all. I, I think the reason why Rashawn has been brought up in so many conversations this offseason is I think, well, one, it makes sense with Sabonis now here. But two, I think Rashawn is one of the best trade assets that the Kings have. And it's funny, I've had conversations with different, different people who were surprised to hear me say that because of the off-court drama that, that Rashawn had to deal with. But I still believe Rashawn is, is tremendously valuable. And look, Rashawn earned the opportunity that he got here in Sacramento. There are some people that still believe that Rashawn Holmes is only a starter on a bad basketball team. And I understand that, but if Rashawn Holmes is coming off your bench, if he can provide a little more rim protection and provide that offense, the effort, the intensity, the hustle that we don't just want, but expect out of him on a nightly basis. Plus if hopefully the guy can stay healthy after all the eye injuries, the poor guy had last off season, I think he's a tremendous boost for the Sacramento Kings uh, off the bench. So it's certainly not a bad thing at all. If, for Sean Holmes remains a king. I've said a number of different times, Matt, and and I don't um, mean this disparaging at all to Sean Holmes, but I think that's the perfect role for him in, in the NBA is to be a backup big and somebody that you know, depending on what happens in the in the game, maybe can finish the game for you. It wasn't very long that we got an opportunity to see it because he just snatched the starting job away from him. But we saw that when uh, he was backing up Dwayne Detman when he first got to Sacramento. There were times where he was the bench guy, but he played so well, they would finish games with Rashawn Holmes, and he, and he brought a, a different level of um, uh, intensity and energy off that bench that sometimes you just couldn't get off the floor, and he would finish some games. I don't think he's going to finish games over Sabonis most nights, but you never you never know with, with, the, with he, what he's able to do coming off that bench, and I think this is a great role for him if he were to stay in Sacramento and be the backup big. And on top of that, Kenny, I, I mean, I don't know Mike Brown. I, I hope to have the opportunity to get to know him a little bit more. And I don't know his system necessarily yet. But Rashawn Holmes strikes me as a Mike Brown guy. Like mm -hmm. Davion Mitchell strikes me as a Mike oh, Brown yeah. guy, a guy who's going to go in there, put in the work, work hard. You don't have to question the intensity. You don't have to question the hustle. And I think that I don't think there's any reason why Rashawn Holmes can't become a reliable, if nothing else, rim protector and defender off the bench to protect that paint a little bit. Like, I think he's perfectly capable of that. He he showed more of his scoring side over the last couple seasons, kind of because the Sacramento Kings needed it. But Rashawn has the athleticism. He has the quickness. He has the the verticality uh, to be able to uh, block shots, to be able to protect the rim. And we've seen that he's not half bad on the perimeter himself. So I, 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 Rashawn Holmes strikes me as a guy that Mike Brown would be very happy to have as part of his roster and have as part of his ro rotation. I still think there's a very good chance that the Kings move Rashawn because he is a valuable, movable piece. But we'll just have to wait and see how Monty plays out the rest of this offseason. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about Mike Brown players. I mean, we've got to mention Dante DiVincenzo's name. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I agree. That, like Dante, Dante feels like a, uh, a Mike Brown guy and, you know, much to the same vein of, of uh, Davion Mitchell. And it feels like there's, you know, maybe some things that need to be corrected, some things that need to be uh, repaired there. Um, but I, I don't know. It 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 sure makes sense to to see uh, see if Monty McNair can get that worked out with with Dante this off season. I don't know what the cost is going to be. I mean, obviously that's the you know could be a major determining factor in all of this. But mm -hmm. given what Mike Brown's objectives are, sure feels like Dante Divincenzo checks a lot of those boxes. Yeah, and again, things can change over an off season, but I just I don't understand. I don't see a scenario where Mike Brown has, or excuse me, Monty McNair has wanted Dante Divincenzo as long as he has. Finally, gets him and then lets him walk after a handful of games, even if his camp is not necessarily happy with how they used him over the like. Monty McNair really likes what Dante Divincenzo can bring, and I think un this is like an unfortunate reality, but I think Divincenzo's injury helped the Kings in the sense that they were able to acquire him for maybe less than what they had to initially give up. And on top of that, they can resign him or bring him back for maybe less money than he was going to get. If you were to ask a couple of years ago when he was starting for the, the Milwaukee bucks. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I look at the situation as the Kings have control. They have the restricted rights. If some team swoops in and massively overpays him, it's like, okay, we like you, but unfortunately goodbye, best of luck to you and congratulations on that big contract. But I don't think that's the kind of money that DiVincenzo is going to get. And I think the Kings are going to be in a fine position to test the market and wait. Very similar to like they did with Rashawn Holmes, right? Last offseason, we're talking about who's going to come in and pay for Rashawn Holmes. Are the Kings going to be able to get him on a valuable deal? I still think Rashawn Holmes' contract, even if he didn't necessarily play up to it this season, and he's not expected to be the starting big anymore here, 
I still think his contract is extremely valuable for what he provides. So I think Monty's playing the same game and, and he's in a position to win it. A guy that gets lost in the shuffle by everybody, including ourselves here uh, on D'Lo and KC, that, that kind of came up today because he was there as well. And that's Terrence Davis. Yep. And he's a guy that I think one of the, the reports on him and, and the type of player he is, is he's probably a – some people look at him as a, a pretty good defender. He's not locked down or anything like that, but he's a willing defender. He's got quick hands, quick feet. He's physical. And we talk about Dante DiVincenzo looking like a, a Mike Brown guy. Terrence Davis might be a Mike Brown type of guy as well with what he's able to do physically on the perimeter. Do you do you see – I think a lot of people have written off Terrence Davis even being here or being a part of what they do next year. Do you see him possibly being a part of what Mike Brown wants to do here? And to be fair, Kenny, I think I've written off Terrence Davis in a lot of ways. Like it's 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 the constant reminder of, oh yeah, Terrence Davis is still a part of this team, and that's that's kind of the thinking of what have you done for me lately, right? I don't want to put too many eggs into the basket that is Terrence Davis because even when he was here and he admitted it, we talked about it. I asked him a question about it at the start of this season. He's still wildly inconsistent. He kind of left this season with, uh, leaving a good taste in the Kings fans or in Kings fans' mouths because he had a really, really good game towards the end of his time this season before he was uh, he was re-injured or, or I honestly don't even remember entirely what happened. He had surgery or something, right? He so did, yeah. Um, yeah, and, but he had a really good game towards the end of his time with the Kings, his best game as a King, but he hasn't been able to show that consistently. That being said, the skill set that Terrence Davis provides is in a major way what the Sacramento Kings team needs. The the, the spacing, uh, the, the, the shooting ability. I mean, the Kings definitely could use that offensively. And then defensively, I think he has the capability. He hasn't necessarily shown it, but not too many players on this Kings roster have shown it. He has the potential, if Mike Brown is able to establish a defensive system that he can get the entire team to buy into, there's no reason to, for me to believe why Terrence Davis can't buy into it. I think following Terrence Davis and the position battle that he has with Dante DiVincenzo, maybe Davion Mitchell, if the Kings draft Jaden Ivey, maybe Jaden Ivey, or even Harrison Barnes, if they want to kind of play him at the three spot. Like, I think there's going to be a major battle for playing time involving Terrence Davis in, in training camp, and I'm excited to follow that. Uh, TD, you ready to rock this season? Uh, is that, I, honestly, I don't know. Is that a trick question? Like, <laughs> It's all right, TD. You're listening to D-Lo and C-C on ESPN 1320 KIFM West Sacramento. KRXQ. HD2 Sacramento and Odyssey Station and driven by last year's Elk Grove Dodge. Matt George, the boss over at ABC10 and the host of the Locked on Kings podcast with us here. Go ahead. We, we got through the first 12 minutes. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Oh, yeah, I know what yeah. you want to do. Here we yeah, go. So, hold on. I mean, first off, putting my name. Did you put my name after or before James Ham? Because because putting my name after James Ham in that little promo you cut. Look. Here's, here's the deal. Like Keegan Murray is the great, the best thing that could ever happen to the Sacramento Kings. Keegan Murray is going to be the greatest pick maybe in the history of all time of basketball, like move over LeBron, move mm. over Kobe. Like Keegan Murray is the greatest thing. No, I, I'm a big fan of Keegan Murray. And, and I actually agree in a lot of ways with a lot of things that you said. And I'm still going through this inner struggle, this inner battle of, like, I personally think that Keegan Murray is absolutely fine to take it number four, and the Kings will not regret that decision. But I did, and I talked about this a lot last week on Locked on Kings, if the Kings are going to really, really, really try to put the pressure on teams like Detroit or Indiana, it sounds like Indiana actually likes the idea of Keegan Murray, so mainly it's Detroit. If they really want to put the pressure on the Detroit Pistons and say Keegan, or rather Jay Nivey's not going to be there at five, there's no way he's going to be there at five. You have to move up. I think Monty also has to be willing to see that through to where if you don't get the deal that you're wanting from them or any other team that wants to move up and get Jaden Ivey, you might just have to take him and follow through on your promise. And that doesn't mean you can't move him later on. Just because you draft the player doesn't mean he's guaranteed to be with you in, going into next season. So I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. If the Kings go into next season, rather, if the Kings go into Friday, and it's Jaden Ivey in a King's cap, and it's not just because he's wearing it because he's been traded, which is so stupid, and I hate that they do that because it ruins their draft night picture. If Jaden Ivey is the Sacramento King come Friday, I'm not going to be mad at it. Really, I'm not. I have questions, but I have questions about every single guy. 
I personally think Keegan Murray would be a great pick at number four. And I, I, I've had great debates and great conversations with people that get Jaden Ivey versus Keegan Murray conversation over the last month have really, really enjoyed it. But where people lose me is this idea that Jaden Ivey is so monumentally better than Keegan Murray. I could make an easy argument that Keegan Murray is the better player right now. It's easy to make the argument that Jaden Ivey has the higher ceiling. Most people believe that, but in order to reach the ceiling, you have to realize that potential. And it's not just Jaden Ivey who has to realize that, it's the Sacramento Kings who have to help him get there. And that's a big part of the puzzle as well. I think Keegan Murray comes in day one, uh, is a starter for the Sacramento Kings, help the Kings make the playoffs. Or Casey, you were talking earlier in the show about how important it is to you to just make the playoffs. Keegan Murray gets you closer to the playoffs right away than Jaden Ivey does, in my opinion. And... On top of that, I really, truly, and I'm not just saying this, I really don't think the gap of ceilings between Jaden Ivey and Keegan Murray is as wide as people are making it out to be. Hmm. What you said about Jaden Ivey and, and how you'd be happy on Friday morning if, if he was picked or obviously Keegan Murray was picked, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. But I'd be happier with another scenario, I think. <laughs> and I want I want to know how you feel if you wake up on Friday morning and you're talking about the Kings drafting Johnny Davis, Dyson Daniels, AJ Griffin, because they orchestrated a trade that had them moving back, getting, I don't know, Kyle Kuzma, John Collins, whatever the case may be, to move back into the draft acquire a starter how would you feel about that there's a lot of things there number one is i better be talking about those guys you just said as consolation prizes and that's no disrespect to them but if if dyson daniels is the pick it better be in hey the kings also got dyson daniels after getting this guy yeah that's what i'm saying like you you pick those guys at 9 10 11 but the first name out of your mouth and the first name that I've heard even Sean Cunningham saying on Fox 40 on, on the Kings beat podcast was Kyle Kuzma. And I think we talked about this last time. Like, no, I'm not trading the fourth overall pick for Kyle Kuzma. Even if he makes your team better day one, if he makes your team better next season, like that's like, there's, I, I don't know what the trade is out there. I don't think you should have to trade number four you know for John Collins either, but you know, what's funny about that. Is Wizards fans are we're not trading you Kyle Kuzma <laughs> for the fourth pick. Are you crazy? We'll give you the tenth and maybe Rui, but Kyle <laughs> Kuzma. The the question the question the that comment sections are always fun. The the question that I always ask with this, and it's an impossible question to ask. There is no answer today, right? I gotta get that, but I'll ask it anyway. Do you believe Kyle Kuzma was what 17 and 8 last year? 17 and 7? Do you believe Keegan Murray or Jaden Ivey will have a better career than Kyle Kuzma? See, when people talk about the four, yeah, the four in theory, yes. But if you're talking about a guy that you would select a four who's not going to ever reach the heights of John Collins, not ever going to reach the, reach the heights of Kyle Kuzma or Julius Randle or anybody like that, then it's it's a fair trade. I so I hear what you're saying. One, I do think that both of those players are going to be better than Kyle Kuzma and have better careers than Kyle Kuzma. Number one, number two is are those the numbers Kyle Kuzma is going to get in Sacramento as the at best third guy? Like I, I I'm not trying to, and I don't. You same thing. You could ask the same question about like Keegan Murray comes into the league averaging what did he average 21 points last year with Iowa and stuff like that, and, and he's not going to get that in Sacramento. Maybe his, or probably not his rookie season. Maybe not ever. I get that. But I, I personally think both those players are going to be better than Kyle Kuzma, and I don't think that Kyle Kuzma that we've seen is going to be the Kyle Kuzma that would come here to Sacramento. In fact, I wouldn't want him to be. I would expect the Kyle Kuzma role player that comes in and makes the winning plays that Mike Brown and the Kings need in order to be successful. That's what I would expect to get. And again, I'm not trading the number four pick for that. Just like if the Kings acquired John Collins, yeah, he comes with a fat contract. The John Collins of Atlanta – isn't coming in here to Sacramento, at least in my opinion. I don't think the John Collins of Atlanta is the same as the John Collins of Sacramento. He's behind Fox and he's definitely behind DeMontis Sabonis. So he's got to come in here and buy in. So that's, if I'm trading for the John Collins of Atlanta to be that guy, then maybe I consider trading the number four. That's not the John Collins that the Kings would be trying to acquire. So I look at the same way as, as acquiring Kyle Kuzma. Now, if it's Bradley Beal, and I think I've shared my reservations with you guys about 
why I'd be hesitant with Bradley Beal, just because I don't expect he'd ever return to the Sacramento Kings after one year, but he's an incredible player. If you're trading for Bradley Beal, yeah, Bradley Beal is coming in here and saying, okay, I'm the man here. Like that's, I get that. That's what I'm okay trading the number four for. That's why it's so difficult to trade picks this high in the draft, in my opinion. But here's the problem. And and here's where, here's where we always outkick their coverage. Washington would never in this draft, never trade Bradley Beal for the number four. I agree. And Bradley Bill is, a, what would you say, a fringe all-star who they don't even know is coming back? And they look at Jaden Ivey and Keegan Murray and be like, you want to trade us? You want us to give you Bradley Bill for these two? They will look at you crazy. So now, like, that's what I'm saying. In theory, yeah, the four, you're getting this. We we, we like. Well, it's think. not, though. That's not fair, though, because you really don't trade caliber players the caliber of Bradley Beal unless Bradley Beal tells them outright, I'm not re-signing. Yeah. So do what you need to do this offseason. Even be- I hear what you're saying, but even besides that, Bre- the- Washington would never do that because they. I I disagree. They trade yeah, him for absolutely. the point. If Bradley Beal told them they, if Bradley Beal said yeah, I'm not coming not back, yeah, if he's not, if he hasn't said anything, like right now he hasn't said anything, I'm not coming back. I'm yeah, not. You got to hold out hope. And he's just a better player. These guys aren't going to be as good as Bradley Beal. Oh, there's no question about that. But that's that like that that's that's like rarefied air when you talk about trading a Bradley Beal. Bradley Bill's also Bradley Bill's really good. He's also not Kevin Durant. <laughs> like, oh, but he's Bradley Beal is real. We are yeah. not going to disparage Bradley no, Beal. We're not disparaging him, but this is a guy. This, like I said, they're not. In my opinion, I don't see these guys reaching that level. No, I, 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 I. That's and like I'm fine with that. But like you're not. You're not. I don't think you're drafting someone at two going. You're reaching Bradley Beal's level. Like if you're if you're Washington and Brad says I'm not coming back, it's how are we going to fix this? Well, we have the opportunity to get the fourth pick, so we do it. By the way, we've all acknowledged this. None of this is happening. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely none of this is happening. But I think that's the like. There's it's not a measurement what what you think the number four pick could be. It's not a measurement of who you 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 trade for. But but, but it but it is. When you guys are talking about Kyle Kuzma and John Collins, like I'm not trading a four for Kyle Kuzma. And John I'm, Collins. I'm not. And what if they're never better than him? Like, well, and, and that's the risk real, you take. There, there's they're a not, real possibility these guys are never better than these guys that you turn your nose up to trade for. Okay. Washington made the playoffs last year with Kyle Kuzma as the second best player on the team. No, he wouldn't be the second best player here. Um, He'd be the third. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can Like no. No, but I, I'm fine if you go get Kyle Kuzma. Just do it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Well, that would be that would actually be best case scenario if you can get all these guys, Collins, Kuzma, whatever, without using the four. That'd be the best case scenario. And then with the four, of course, Matt, you draft Jaden Ivey. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> Jaden Ivey all the way, hundred percent. Whatever you say, Dilo. No, I, honestly, like that's where I think uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all in multiple ways for the Kings to inquire about John Collins. And if the Kings got the sense that, okay, they could legitimately get John Collins from Atlanta without trading the four. Hey, now maybe all of a sudden we're much more willing to take Jaden Ivey because we got our four figured out in Collins. So sorry, Keegan, like that, that spot, that hole that we need to fill suddenly there's a, a better chance to fill it. Like if you were to tell me you could choose between the Kings drafting Murray at four or the Kings drafting Jaden Ivey at four and working out a trade down the road that, brings in John Collins and the worst you're giving up is Harrison Barnes. And I would even hesitate about that. Cause I still really, really like HB for the Kings. Like I, I would probably choose Jaden Ivey and John Collins in a heartbeat over, over Keegan Murray. So just like the same thing happened if OKC or Houston threw a wrench and everything and said, Hey, we're taking Jaden Ivey in the top three. And one of those four of, of Paolo or Chet or Jabari falls to you. Sorry, Keegan. Sorry, Jaden. Like uh, my my decision's made at that point. So yeah. <laughs> sorry, Atlanta. Sorry, Washington. I'm not trading in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm absolutely not trading. Not. So I I'm I think we're getting uh, to me. It's 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 one of two options. The Kings are either going to trade back to five with Detroit because they desperately want Jaden Ivy, or the Kings are just going to make their selection on draft night between Keegan Murray and Jaden Ivey. Like, I don't, I don't think the pick is being moved all the way back to 10 or 11 with New York. And I've dealt with New York Knicks fans who are trying to try and convince me why the Kings should consider taking back Cam Reddish. It's like, I, no, it's like, it's that not- was, that was actually, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that wasn't, uh, that was Kenny under his New York Knicks handle burner account. That, that, that was Kenny there. And I'm, I, and I don't know if, if Monty feels this way too, but like, 
first round future first round picks don't interest me like i know in in our ultimate mock draft i was able to get the future first rounder or next year's first rounder from indiana added in as kind of a sweetener there but that, that's not a secret anymore oh no it's out <laughs> okay it's right, I, didn't know, I, didn't, I didn't know that was out <laughs> yeah, that is out but i mean <laughs> Future first round picks do nothing for me. And I don't think they do anything for Monty McNair. That was another major takeaway that I had from Mike Brown's press conference. Mike Brown made it very clear multiple times. He's here to win right now. This was no like, Hey, we're going to rebuild two or three years. And then we're going to be in the picture. And, and those are kind of things that a little bit you heard from former Kings head coaches. You heard from Luke Walton. They all wanted to win, but they said, Hey, this is a process. We're going to take our time. We're going to get there. Mike Brown did say that implementing a good defense is going to take time, but he said, we're, I'm trying to win day one. I'm trying to win right now. I took this job with the expectation to win. So what the Kings goal for next season is, is it's not in question at all. And so we have to look at everything they do in the draft, everything they do in free agency, every trade they make as does it help them accomplish that goal and, and find out if that's the right route to take. With almost 800 votes, only two options available. Who are you picking at number four? Jay Nivey or Keegan Murray? 73% say Jay Nivey. You all suck. You're trash. You're garbage. You have no <laughs> eye for talent. He's the people's pick. No. It's the people's He's pick. The, people. uh, the, the, other the, 20, people. the other 27% are big followers of Matt George and the Locked on Kings podcast, yeah, cool. who I'm going to be joining uh, <laughs> later on this evening, which I'm very much looking forward to. Matt, we appreciate you so 